first, let's talk about the Middle East, where Israel is continuing its plans to moving forward with annexation in the West Bank. Now, historically, and it has been the case since, of course, the late 60s, since the 67 war, Israel has engaged in an ongoing occupation in the West Bank. They withdrew from Gaza and the Sharon area, but of course, that was not substantive. In fact, they maintained a brutal siege on Gaza and with periodic uh, high-intensity bombing campaigns that were condemned almost uniformly across the world besides the United States. Even former Tory Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, David Cameron, correctly called Gaza an open-air prison. And even as the repression has continued and the so-called peace process has been discredited, the closest that Israel actually came to making any type of legitimate two-state solution deal was in the waning days of the Ehud Olmert administration, not the 2000 negotiations with Arafat was incorrectly solely blamed for and smeared by U.S. leaders. So even as that has happened, Israel internally has progressed further and further to the extreme right under the Netanyahu government in various coalitions with parties that are said to represent the center, but of course just representing more polite face of Israeli repression of Palestinians, as well as other extreme right-wing settler and religious parties. And now Netanyahu is moving forward formally with annexing 30% of the West Bank. And this is in accordance, don't forget, with the Trump plan. Mike Pompeo stated last year that the Trump administration does not find any Israeli settlements to be in violation of international law. Now, the United States, of course, always, no matter what, firmly and staunchly supported Israel, but previous administrations, both Republican and Democrat, had actually politely made clear that, of course, these settlements are a violation of international law and make it physically, logistically impossible for any type of equitable peace settlement. This has been the geographic reality for some time. And even as the brutality has continued, now Netanyahu has found renewed political life, even under serious corruption investigations and an erosion of the already profoundly limited Israeli democracy under his leadership in fully embracing an overt apartheid regimen. Not only will annexation mean an increase in Israeli controlled land, but the proposed maps would sequester Palestinian communities so that they're surrounded by Israeli controlled lands, meaning travel from place to place will be completely controlled by Israel, which of course it already is in many parts of the West Bank, including things that could come out of another era entirely, such as racially segregated or ethnically segregated roads. Here is a brief excerpt from a film, The Truth About Annexation, put out by the pro-peace Israeli fund, uh, New Israel Fund. What happens to private Palestinian lands in the annexed area? Are they expropriated? And what about the Palestinians that live in communities that Israel doesn't recognize? Mm. Do they become illegal aliens on their lands? מפת הסיפוח ככל הנראה תכלול הרבה מאוד שטח וכמה שפחות פלסטינים שהם יישארו בעצם מחוץ לשטח המסופח אבל הם יהיו מוקפים מכל עבריהם בישראל הריבונית והדבר הזה מזכיר מאוד את, את המדיניות של דרום אפריקה בתקופת האפרטהייד לדחוק את השחורים אל עבר שמורות ולהגיד לעולם זה מדינות, הם אזרחים של המדינות האלה, ככה אנחנו דוחקים את הפלסטינים לאזורים הבדויים שלהם ואומרים לעולם זה מדינה, לכן זה לא אפרטהייד, לא לא, כך נראה גם האפרטהייד המקורי. And by the way, just if you're listening to some podcast, that's an analyst making clear the very overt parallels between South Africa and 2020, apartheid South Africa and 2020 Israel-Palestine. Those analogies, if you don't like them, it should be clear, were originally made by people like Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu, who explicitly connected those struggles. This is former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert asking a more practical and political question. Why now on Fareed Zakaria on CNN? Um, does this have something to do with his relationship with Trump, with the November elections, what, what are your thoughts? I think, quite frankly, that if he does this, 
what it reflects in my mind is a growing uh, concern on the side of Netanyahu that Trump will not be re-elected. Everyone says that this is an opportunity for us because Trump supports Israel. But if Netanyahu is confident that Trump will be re-elected, why hurry up now? Why not wait until after the elections and then while Trump is president and being re-elected, he can coordinate it with the Americans. The feeling that he hurries up is because he may not be confident that Trump will be re-elected. I think that uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, you know, in 2012, uh, the Israeli prime minister was very much involved in what appeared to be an attempt to uh, support the then uh, Republican uh, candidate, um, uh, Mitt Romney. So what you have there is the former Prime Minister Olmert, who, in addition to uh, committing significant war crimes in Gaza, was the last and maybe actually only Prime Minister that, at least proposal-wise and consistently rhetoric-wise, has been serious about not a full binational democracy, but a genuine two-state 67 border solution, which no other, uh, including Barack, if you look at the substance of what he ordered, yes, he did make withdrawals in the late 90s, but the ultimate deal that was presented to Arafat in the waning days of the Clinton administration would not be tenable for any Palestinian leadership. And Omer has coupled this criticism uh, with an increasingly harsh attack on Netanyahu's leadership. But in many respects, Omer is sort of a man of another time when Israel was concerned about bipartisan support and presenting a brand of liberalism, even as it repressed Palestinians. Now, there's been attempts to confuse the issue. Netanyahu has claimed that annexation could begin on July 1st. Apparently has not begun yet, but the t- date went without policy announcement from the government, leading to speculation about possible pressure against this move from the United States. Boris Johnson, the UK prime minister, among others, have expressed their opposition to annexation. However, just because annexation did not, appear, um, did not occur on July 1st does not mean it's going away. The forces have, that have kept Netanyahu in power are still politically strong, and the slow ebbing of Palestinian land may be easier to achieve than a large-scale annexation. In fact, this would reflect decades of land theft from the Palestinian people or uh, So much of this plan depends on this Trump administration, and it is very likely that Netanyahu will try to secure as much of that as possible, as Elmer pointed, before a a potential Joe Biden administration. However, we expect any type of real shift from Biden, very unlikely. Yeah, I think it's really important that, you know, we're all, you know, pushing it and making as clear, uh, you know, what's happening with annexation and, uh, you know, the slow ebb, as you were just mentioning. Now, I think it's really important for people to understand, too, how serious the division of, of land being basically separating communities from one another um, you know, is, is devastating to families and communities. It, it obviously devastates your economic opportunities. If you can't leave your village or your town without getting permission from Israel to do so, you know, people really do get stranded, in, in, you know, in a country that's their own. Um, they're unable to be able to see family members for years at a time. Um, you know, I, I cannot remember the young boy's name, but there's pl- plenty of stories of families who have a child born in one area who's not able to come back and live with their parents in another just because they were born in the wrong part of, uh, of Palestine. And, uh, you know, it's something that is, is absolutely tragic. And I think that it's 100 percent right too to use the words that Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela does. Uh, you know, apartheid, when you are separating people based on their, their background, um, you know, that 100% is apartheid. When you have different rules and laws and regulations for different people, different religions and different ethnicities, that's apartheid. And, uh, you know, we have to, one, oppose it, but also in our context too, really uh, push back against the Trump administration because Trump has really opened up the door for Netanyahu to pr- pursue a very, very aggressive policy uh, that he might not have been able to, um, you know, before. So, yeah, and what I think is 
interesting just for, as an outside looking in is how Israel chose this path, uh, especially even really recently with uh, when Netanyahu came and spoke to the Republican House. Um, like, I, I remember having arguments about Israel and like none obviously is formed as on this show, but about, you know, can you really are they as right wing as they look and things like that? And when he did that, it basically just confirmed, right? Like, the, is, like Netanyahu and the and like what he represents is more in line with the Republican Party, regardless of what Obama tries to do. I don't know. It's, it's sort of frightening that they they threw all in on a party that at that point, it looked like they were going to lose and stay outside of the executive branch for a long time. Um, I don't know. It's, it seems it just seemed very, very strategic. And I don't know. Concerning. Not only is that true, but Israel is. In some ways, you could say the global epicenter of the far right. I mean, Hungary is key. And at this point, it's globally peripher- it's proliferated globally. But if you actually even look at even some of the kind of early intellectual architecture of the sort of new ultra nationalism that we see, uh, some of that definitely comes from Israeli intellectuals. Um, the sort of, you know, formal turning away. And again, it's tricky because Israel was obviously, you know, it was never a proper, fully secular democracy because there's idea, you know, there's identity boundaries around. This is one of my core critiques of all identitarian formations at the end of the day come from growing up around um, at times of horrific apologetics around Israel and, um, and, and so on. But definitely under Netanyahu and accelerating in the, under the uh, Obama era, there was a real emphasis on sort of turning to this kind of explicitly sort of national, neo-nationalistic politics. And this tracked with Israel, um, you know, making common cause with extreme far right uh, you know, parties in Europe who, you know, at least ancestrally, would have been profoundly anti-Semitic, although, of course, now their sort of bigotry had turned to Islam. Uh, there's a book, it's, called, it's by Yoarm Hazani, and it's called The Virtue of Nationalism. And this book is the sort of, you know, this is the kind of intellectual, the pop version you get from people like Bannon. So it's very, very important. You can't separate um, any variety of attacks on essentially pluralistic democracies and full substantive rights for minority populations that are occurring internationally um, without the very specific contribution of the Israeli right to, again, you know, justify into perpetuity um, governing millions of people that are not under any form of democratic legitimacy. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And, you know, the real difference, it, rhetoric does matter. So even though, you know, Barack's deal is ridiculous, um, there's obviously bigger claims that go back to the Nakba in 47. There's a lot of complexities here. But Olmert and Barack, particularly Olmert, consistently used the word apartheid. Israeli leaders used the word apartheid before that came to the United States because the ones that had at least a buy-in to some sense of genuine, in the positive sense, liberal democracy mm-hmm. – they saw this and they said, this isn't going to work. It's not even an ethical question. And what Netanyahu and others anticipated was that actually between the Republican Party, between some of the currents rising in Europe and elsewhere, uh, including some real synergies with BJP in India, mm-hmm. why not? Why couldn't this work? Yeah. And so that's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big question today. And I, and I actually think, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this more later, but I, I think one of the other problems with this, with the identitarian turn that Adolf Reed critiques is that there are, there are parallels coming from completely different uh, places, but that w- there needs to be some baseline fight in the political realm about the idea of and practical expression of full rights and equity for all in a substantive way, because it is under siege and the right side of it, a major part of it uh, is connected with groundwork that was laid politically and intellectually in Israel, completely inseparable from vicious sieges on Gaza and an apartheid situation in, in the West Bank. I, 
I, I agree completely. I just, I just wanted to add like on a, on a personal sort of, uh, there's a really amazing book um, by a writer, uh, Morid uh, Bargatti that I highly suggest called I was born there. I was born here. Um, mm-hmm. And it's very, it's about, he's Palestinian and he's very much, you know, it's about that kind of political struggle on what life is like, but it's very powerful because for Americans who are experiencing this sort of in an abstracted way, um, it's sometimes, I don't know, it's like so many stories are sort of decentered from that, like full lives. And like when we talk about, for example, like these people not being able to move from town to town, it's like you hear that that's horrible. But when you actually start to read the stories and the actual like emotional uh, capacity there, it becomes something that's very visceral and important. So I highly suggest reading his his work. Um, Morid Bargatti is his name. He's an amazing poet. And I just, uh, I think it's something that's really important to dive into if you have the ability. Awesome. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.